Hi, this is Adam. This is another Eye on North Carolina blog. We are here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina at the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Arts. I'm here with curator Cor Fisher to talk about the exhibit, A Common Turn, and everything that encompasses it. And uh, Cor, it's a pleasure to meet you. Hi, it's so nice to meet you, Adam. So, how did you guys get this exhibit in here, and what's kind of your focus? Well, this exhibition is really about finding humor within sculpture, within objects, and finding it also in our interactions with objects. So there's also, in addition to a survey of Eric's work from the last seven years, we have three key video pieces, which are kind of meant to, you know, spark some kind of connections and associations around humor. And they often involve artists working with objects and doing kind of slapstick fun. And people recognize the object, or is it very abstract, or is it open to interpretation? That's a great question. It really depends. So within Eric Furman's work, there's a kind of range. It goes from objects like this that we can recognize. This one down here is called phone. Um, it's a kind of nostalgic throwback uh, to the old telephone before the cell phone. And then behind it, right there, you see a piece called toupee which is a little bit more evocative, so it starts to move towards abstraction, but you can see that little thing on the top of that sausage-like shape is kind of falling off in the way that we would see a toupee probably yeah. fall off someone's head. Um, so then we also see a kind of movement towards geometric abstraction. Um, and also, if you, you know, if you turn around and look at a piece like this, which is probably the tallest piece that's ever been installed at Sika, oh, wow. um, this is a piece called Endless Column, and it's actually a riff on the modernist sculptor Constantine Brancusi, who also did an endless column, with the twist that this one, you know, has handles in it and it's a lot more functional than objects. So uh, this is a kind of play on art history, and a lot of his works either play with language and kind of say tell jokes through the titles, or they sort of upturn familiar art historical works that we've seen. Right, well, too bad you can't put pegs in them and start climbing it like a mountain climb. Or it's like. true, it's very inviting and <laughs> kind of makes you want to swing around. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does. Another series of works he does called Bonies, which are basically feet that suggest bodies, and they're kind of grotesque, <laughs> and they're kind of fetishistic, nice. but they're also, you know, they're also really um, playful forms of abstraction that relate to our body. One of the ideas of the show, um, from my point of view as a curator, is that when you turn around a corner or you see a new kind of angle of the space, that you experience a moment of surprise. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of thinking about the comic turn. The comic turn is definitely happening in his work, but it's also something that's experiential that we feel as we move through the space. Right. So these are not you know, these works are meant to be exuberant and approachable. They're not, there's no simple interpretation of them. I don't want people to be like, ah, oh, what does it all mean? I right. want them to just kind of enjoy it on right. some level. But here I will say that um, this, is, this is called Bird in Space, Pigeon Toe. And that is a play on a very famous, another very famous um, iconic sculpture by Brancusi, which is this top piece, which is called Bird in Space. And Brancusi was really, you know, taking inert matter, marble, and he also cast it in bronze, and then trying to convey this feeling of a bird soaring in space or flying, which was a very kind of idealistic, modernist gesture. But here what Eric has done is that he's put one of his motifs, kind of jammed them together, and that's the club foot. But he's still making reference to birds because it's called pigeon toe, like, you know, when you have, like, you know, bow legs or pigeon toed right. feet, it kind of suggests this awkwardness. Here's this wall of what are called bonies. And the titles are really funny. So we have Boney Adonis, we have um, Inclined Boney, we have a piece called Inky Strut. Inky Strut, what is that? And Boney Loafer, which was at the mm -hmm. end. Inky Strut is just, you know, again, it kind of speaks to how the titles are evocative. Um, and they suggest kind of different personalities, even within this really truncated form. So, you know, we 
kind of see this repeated motif. It has like the knobby joints that we might associate with our knee or our elbow or our hip. And it's kind of this compressed body, but then the title also gives it this different personality. This show opened just two days ago, so mm -hmm. you're coming at it with fresh eyes and so is everyone else. And nice. hopefully tonight we'll have the River Run Independent Film Festival. We'll have many people looking at this. This is again another kind of comic turn, a kind of gesture in the show where I'm trying to draw connections between Eric Furtman's work and a kind of video practice that elicits humor in objects. Here we have a series of different treatments of a head. This piece on the end is called um, Portrait, and all of the pieces following it are part of a series called Head. So he's taking Actually, it's a woodblock print, which is kind of interesting because his relationship between drawing and sculpture, you know, all of that is happening basically on the page, and then he's taking wood and, you know, creating, realizing two-dimensional drawings in three-dimensional form. Right. Here, he's even bridging that connection more closely because woodblock printing is almost a sculptural relief process where you carve away from the plate and then you're left with the image. They're, they're weird, cartoonish heads. Um, you know, he's made these also sculpturally um, in ways that are less abstract. Right. And then when you turn around, we see, um, this was actually for me a great spark for this idea of putting video together with his work. It's a, it's a small video piece that was originally done on film by a Dutch conceptual artist named Ger van Elk. All oh, right, there, perfect timing. Exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called The Well-Shaken Cactus. And essentially, it does exactly what it says. He takes a cactus, a kind of domestic houseplant, and he shaves off all of the spikes. So that's the, so one of the things that happens there, we're used to seeing a razor giving a kind of military right. buzz cut on a head. So we kind of immediately associate this object with the human body, with the head again. Right, and you're kind of humanizing the plant, too. There's an essence of, you know, this is, uh, cactus is a living organism itself, and we're adding that human element by you know, using an object that we use for ourselves. That's right, exactly. Yeah. This kind of art was made in the spirit of definitely um, expanding what encompasses art. So actions can become art. Right. Everyday things that I do. Right. Obviously, this is an absurd action that you wouldn't do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, plant care could become art. Right. For of course. So that's a kind of interesting thing about that um, piece, and I hope in this juxtaposition that you know people make the head connection, but the piece people also kind of think a little bit more loosely about how we can communicate with the human body. So here we have a show by a Greensboro-based artist, Jennifer. She's a professor of painting at UNC Greensboro, and this is her first solo show um, in North Carolina. And it's a really exciting opportunity for the artist to kind of stretch her, you know, wings and kind of realize things on a different scale. Um, she mainly works with figuration. She works with kind of the elemental things of picture making, so landscape, figure. Um, and storytelling, and the idea of this show is really that she's kind of working in an allegorical style, but we have to create our own stories from her work, right? Because unlike iconic religious paintings in the past where there were very clear coded meanings, she's using a lot of those same kind of traditions of art history, but um, they're actually kind of very open to interpretation. Which is great. Which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great. So here, for example, and this is a really nice example of what Sika kind of can offer as a contemporary art space to artists. Um, she was invited to do a site-specific collage wall. So she came and she actually did this piece specifically for this wall. People are thinking about um, Dante's Inferno, which is part of the Divine Comedy, and it's also, you know, a high literary work, an epic poem that many, many other artists, like Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg and William Blake, who's included over there, have kind of pictured um, in their own way. And not just as in terms of illustrating the story, but in terms of 
visually evoking the narrative and this journey of Dante and his teacher Virgil. So here, you know, Jennifer really took a kind of departure. That was her starting point, but you know, it goes kind of in its own place, probably more just towards epic poetry in general. So we see with her use of the figure a kind of sequential narrative. It's unfolding across the length of the wall. And from, we have, left to, from left to right. From right to left, left or left, left to right. right. You have to kind yeah. of figure that out and, yeah. and maneuver the space. Um, you know, we also see like the serpent, and we see a kind of like flowering tree and a fruit tree. So it also maybe reminds us of a religious painting a little bit, but in a much more kind of uh, psychodramatic right. way. Like, well, you can see the faces. I mean, there's intensity there that yes. is very powerful. Yes, it's yeah. a very theatrical treatment of characters that she uses in her in her portraiture, and um, the general kind of idea between putting these two shows alongside of each other is thinking about the tragic and the comic as a kind of spectrum. So, you know, in Jennifer's work, we really get that sense of almost even a post-apocalyptic world, um, but one that takes us back to the beginnings or what we imagine to be in our fantasy, the kind of beginnings of time. Right. So the first thing that, this is my interpretation, the first thing I see there is maybe a reference to the Garden of Eden. Eden. Yes. Just the trees, the greenery, and kind of more of a somber look at the Garden of Eden, perhaps. That's just my interpretation. I think that's a really rich interpretation, yeah. actually. Yes. So Cora, thank you so much for touring us around Sika. There's so much to see here and uh, very excited to be here tonight and I greatly appreciate it. It's a thank pleasure. you so much. Yes.